welcome. My name's Dr. Jason W. Morrison, and I'm a theologist from New South Wales, Australia. Psychologists help people with themselves and other people, and theologists help people with themselves and God. Okay, it's 4.46 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New South Wales, Australia, and we're going to do Acts 25. Let's go. Chapter, Chapter 25. 25. Therefore, Festus, after arriving in the province and taking charge, went up three days later to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews gave him information against Paul. So they began Now notice that it was the people that thought there was something you needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad that had something to say against Paul. These people can't help themselves, you know. Oh gosh. Okay. Here we go. And to beg Festus as a favor to send for Paul to come to Jerusalem. But they were planning to ambush Paul and kill him along the road. Don't worry, this isn't uncommon. Religious people, uh, particularly, excuse me, particularly the ones that think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, underneath, underneath, they're living in Galatians. Um, and this is the trouble with religion. This is the trouble with the people that think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or sa sa stop him from being sad. They're living in Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Um, Gal 5, come on, give us Galatians 5, oh gosh. Galatians 5, here we go, we'll just go with this. Oh, we don't need all that, come on. Now, the list in Galatians 5. Is it 5? I'm sure it is. Here, now. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Now, if you walk by the Spirit, you trust completely in what Christ has done. That's it. That's what walking in the Spirit is. What Jesus has done is enough. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, this is vitally important, viewers. This is vitally important. As soon as you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're endangering yourself. You're setting yourself up for sin. Because as soon as you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're starting to initiate your sinful nature. Now, how many people are sinful nature ridden that have got all the good intentions in the world? They don't even know that if there's something, look, oh, I'm doing this. And deep, you're not saying anything, you're not, but deep inside something's going, yeah, keep trying to make God happy or stop him from being sad because it needs you to do that to get its evil. To get its power out. Look, it tells you here. Why don't I read the Bible? <clears throat> but I say, walk by the Spirit. Now, what's by the Spirit? It's believing that the Word became flesh, miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. Miraculously conceived. God Himself. God's sound conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. Oh, God can't be man and... And it's be sitting on the throne at the same time. How can God be a man and still be a father? God can be ten men if he wants, all at once. But he made himself his son. God made himself his son because the Holy Spirit took the sound of the sound of God, the word of God, and put it in Mary's womb. And he's gone, now God's going to become a man. Watch this. And the Word conceived, and the Word formed into a human, and the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. And it was prophesied that it was going to be Emmanuel. God with us, God is with us, is a, with us is God. It was still God, wasn't it? Because it was His Word that was conceived. Oh, God can't be a man and be sitting on the throne and all that. Oh, of course he can. God can be the father and make himself a son. 
God can be the Father and still be a son. Just because you can't do it doesn't mean God can't do it. So God's now walking around in a body. How else was God going to die? You can't kill eternity. He had to become a man. God took accountability for our harm. Oh, we're all running around trying to get right with God and this and that and all that. God don't care about that. He paid the price for you. <sighs> That's why religious people go sour. That's why there's child sexual immorality. There's child abuse. There's all sorts. There's wife bashing and there's marriages breaking and there's, oh gosh, wake up. God became a man so that he could pay for the mess. He created the devil. He, the woman was deceived. The man deliberately ate. Why did he deliberately eat? Eat. The half of you don't even know this. Why did the man deliberately eat? Because greater love is this, and no, and no, no greater love is this than to lay down your life for a friend. That's why Jesus is the second Adam. Because Adam's done it because he loved her. Why don't you get some love like that? Yeah. That's our identity. That's our identity. Most of us don't know that. Most of us will never know that. That we originate from the Adam who loved. He ate because he loved. He gave it all up because he loved. Oh, he's got to be punished for that. He was punished, all right. But what he did was right. And he took the punishment. Now, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the Bible says. But there was more to it than that. Because I'll tell you this, look. Oh, I'm fired up today. Benora and Jenny B. And here we go. Gosh, jeez, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Feel the Holy Spirit. When God became a man, they called him by prophecy, Emmanuel, God with us. But they named him Jesus. And when they named him Jesus, that was when the word, as a man, was identified. We're going to call this one Jesus. Jesus means saviour. Okay? Forget about God not being a man and all that. God is, was a man. He still is. Jesus was God incarnate. I, oh, that can't be true. How can... Oh, gosh, come on. Come on. When Adam deliberately ate, he did it because he loved. Now, you're involuntarily... Listen to this. Will you listen to this? You're involuntarily born into sin. When you're born, it's not your choice to be born into sin. You're just born into sin. Why? Not because of anything you did, but because of what Adam did. Right? Not because of what you did, but because of what Adam did. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, when the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, when Jesus spoke, it was the sound of God's voice. Remember the Hebrew says in chapter 1 that he spoke in times past by the prophets, but now spoke and speaks through his Son. Christ Jesus was the Word become flesh, God's Word. So when Adam sinned, you didn't sin, but you were involuntarily born into sin because of what Adam did. Right? How much more when Jesus died on the cross, how much more were you involuntarily, without doing anything, without ever having to do anything at all, involuntarily moved from sin to righteousness because of what Jesus did, which was eternally greater, far more powerful than what Adam ever did? Oh, somebody say something out there. 
if you're involuntarily put into sin for something you haven't done, how much more, eternally more, when Jesus died on the cross, were you involuntarily moved into righteousness? You know, they go up to the altar, oh, I want to get saved. You should be going up to the altar saying, if you don't want it, I don't want it because you've already got it. you just got to know about it. Really, all Christianity is, is teaching you about what you've already got. That's all it is. It's not about what you've got to get. It's about what you've already got. Oh, we accept sin. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm a sinner. Why can't you accept the righteousness? It's yours. Forget about trying to do things or not doing things to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's only going to turn you evil. Walk. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Why? Because the desires of the flesh need you to do something or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad. That's how it gets its power. Most religions have got people running around thinking, oh, I'm not right with God. Oh, I've got to get right with God. Oh, gosh, what have I done now? Oh, God. Oh, come on. Get free of it. Now, this is what happens. For the desires of the sinful nature are, or the desires of people that think there's something they need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. But guess what? The flesh can't beat the spirit. It's just a choice. You're even, look, you either think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad and, and, and cause your sinful nature to do whatever it wants. Or you accept what Jesus has done is enough and you walk in the spirit. The spirit's with you. Stop trying to make the spirit be with you. I remember one day I realized, I realized, Oh, I used to try and get the Holy Spirit. I used to try and get full of the Holy Spirit. I'd starve myself. I'd pray. I'd have the Bible going on the Old Testament and this here and the New Testament. Oh, it was a fruitcake. An absolute fruitcake. And then one day I realized I'm trying to get full of the Holy Spirit, but it isn't helping me. I feel like I, I, oh, I, was, I was messed up really messed up the harder i tried the worse it got there was just something so wrong then one day i was reading and it was uh galatians chapter 5 down here look galatians of chapter 5 but the fruit of the spirit so i used to quote the something like what was it oh, a lot of scriptures i used to quote a lot of scriptures every day by memory but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Well, what was the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit was just believing that what Jesus has done is enough and just getting on with me life. And then it said this, against such things, there is no law. And I've gone, there's no law against that. There's no law against you thinking that what Jesus has done is enough. That's how you get empowered. Now, once you think that there's something that you need to do or not do, and listen to me, please, to make God happy or stop him from being sad, or to convince yourself that God's happy with you or not sad with you, this is what happens. Now, the works of the flesh. What's the flesh? It's not your body. It's your sinful nature which needs you to be under the law. Look, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You're not under the law. You're not under anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. But if you are under the idea or the mindset that you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, this is the works of it. This is what the fruit of it's going to be. And it's evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelries, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, 
Now imagine being a, a leader, right? A leader, and and you think you, there's things you need to do or not do to make God happy and stop him from being sad, and you're teaching people this, and you're watching them, and they're just failing. Everybody's just failing, right? Drunkenness, orgies, and the likes of these things. I warned you as a, a, a as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation. What that's saying to you is this. If you think there's something you need to do, oh, you've got to get this, or not do, to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're not living in the kingdom of God. You're not living in the blessing of the kingdom of God because you're not being led by the Spirit. You haven't accepted that what Jesus has done is enough. You just haven't accepted it. You've got to, you just can't you stay out of it and just give God the glory? Say, so you've done it all. There's nothing I can do. I believe it. Now I'm going to get on with my life. Why can't people, why? <coughs> why why I don't think people realize how dangerous religion really is it's horribly dangerous I mean it's deadly dangerous it isn't a joke oh gosh what am I supposed to be doing Acts 25 oh, God. however Festus answered that Paul was to be kept in Caesarea and that he himself was about to go back there shortly. So let those who are in power among you, he said, come down with me and accuse him, if indeed the man has done something wrong. So when he had spent not more than eight or ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he sat down on the judgment seat and commanded Paul to be brought in. When he came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing against him many serious charges that they were unable to prove. Now this is no different, look, I'm sorry, but this is no different to an elders meeting in the Jehovah Witnesses. Oh, they get you up there and they try and, oh, they stick their nose into businesses. It's got nothing to do with religion. Your personal life. Oh, gee, they take control of you, a lot of religious leaders. Not just the Jehovah Witnesses. They're the worst, probably. These cults. They haven't got a clue. They're not trained. They don't know the Bible. Nine out of ten of them. Ninety-nine percent of them. And this is what happens. They bring charges. They're unable to... How many Jehovah, ex-Jehovah Witness videos have I watched? Where... They've proved that everything's all right and the elder's just not going to have it. Somebody ought to grab them by the ear roll and take them out and tell them to leave. It's all, it's all belly up, isn't it? But they couldn't prove anything. Look, they couldn't prove a thing. But Paul said in defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any sin. Festus, desiring to gain favor with the Jews, said in reply to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be judged before me there concerning these things? But Paul said, I am standing before the judgment seat of Caesar, where I ought to be judged. I have done no wrong to the Jews, of which you are also becoming well aware. Now, it's taken him a long time to, to get to this point. But there's religious people that will sell you out even if you've done nothing wrong. And we're witnessing this here. And these are the ones that don't think you're living up to the standard. Jesus is the standard. The Lord is the standard. Now, he's not the standard for you to be unaccountable. Paul's not trying to be unaccountable. But he hasn't really done anything wrong. All he's done is preach the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people that thought there was something that they needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad didn't want to accept that. If I am really a wrongdoer and have committed anything deserving of death, I do not beg off from dying. But if there is no substance to the accusations these men have made against me, no man has the right to hand me over to them as a favor. 
I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, after speaking with the assembly of counselors, replied, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you will go. After some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived in Caesarea for a courtesy visit to Festus. Since they were spending a number of days there, Festus presented Paul's case to the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought information about him, asking for a judgment of condemnation against him. But I replied to them that it is not Roman procedure to hand any man over as a favor before the accused man meets his accusers face to face and gets a chance to speak in his defense concerning the complaint. Now, isn't that interesting? Stuart in Vancouver, Canada. Oh, they're all over him. The Jehovah's Witnesses can't stand him because they're too gutless to answer any of his questions. They just won't. They will not discuss the Bible. They're hopeless. So rather than wanting to discuss the Bible, they do away with people that are um, trying to get rational answers out of them because they're not theologically trained. They're watchtowers, publication, and track society trained, which is no different to a Sunday school class about nonsense. <clears throat> now, um, Stuart doesn't even know who the two people are that have got him, got him charged. He doesn't even know who they are. So when they arrived here, I did not delay. But the next day I sat down on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. Taking the stand, the accusers did not charge him with any of the wicked things I had expected concerning They had nothing. They had absolutely nothing of any sense against him. Concerning him. They simply had certain disputes with him concerning their own worship of the deity and concerning a man named Jesus, who was dead, but who Paul kept asserting was alive. Being at a loss as to how to handle this dispute, I asked if he would like to go to Jerusalem and be judged there concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be kept in custody for the decision by the August One, I commanded him to be held until I should send him on to Caesar. Agrippa then said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you will hear him. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with much pompous show and entered the audience chamber together with military commanders as well as the prominent men in the city. And when Festus gave the command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all you who are present with us. You see this man about whom the whole Jewish populace have petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I perceived that he had done nothing deserving of death. So when this man himself appealed to the August One, I decided to send him. But I have nothing certain to write about him to my Lord. So I brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the judicial examination has taken place, I might have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner, and not also to indicate the charges against him. See, unless the charges are clear, why, why is this guy being in prison? See, they've been, he's been imprisoned on a hearsay. Let's go to 26, come on. Straight on to 26. Here we go. Chapter 26 Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak in your own behalf. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to say in his defense, Concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa, I consider myself happy that it is before you I am to make my defense this day especially because you are an expert on all the customs as well as the controversies among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Indeed, 
The manner of life I led from youth up among my people and in Jerusalem is well known by all the Jews who were previously acquainted with me, if they would be willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our form of worship, I lived as a Pharisee. Now you think about where Paul living as a Pharisee ended up. Where did he end up? He ended up a murderer. You've got to realize what it means to think that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's dangerous. Oh, it might not look dangerous on the surface, but underneath it's a minefield. That's why, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus is so important. Because you lay it all down, you just rest on him and you get on with your life. You don't engage your sinful nature. Your sinful but nature needs rules. Now, for the hope of the promise that was made by God to our forefathers, I stand on trial. This is the same promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled by intensely rendering him sacred service night and day. Concerning this hope, I am accused by Jews, O King. Now, what was the hope? The hope's eternal life because you believe in Christ. Oh, this 144,000 nonsense. It's for everyone that believes in Christ. Everyone. Not just 144. Why is it considered unbelievable among you that God raises up the dead? I, for one, was convinced that I should commit many acts of opposition against the name of Jesus the Nazarene. This is exactly what I did in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the holy ones in prisons, for I had received authority from the chief priests, and when they were to be executed, I cast my vote against them. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to recant, and since I was extremely furious with them, I went so far as to persecute them even in outlying cities. While doing this, as I was traveling to Damascus with authority and a commission from the chief priests, I saw at midday on the road, O king, a light beyond the brilliance of the sun flash from heaven around me and around those traveling with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice say to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? To keep kicking against the goads makes it hard for you. But I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. This is why I have appeared to you, to choose you as a servant and a witness, both of things you have seen and things I will make you see respecting me. And I will rescue you from this people and from the nations to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the authority of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those sanctified by their faith in me. Now listen, listen for a minute. In a religious sense, context, in a religious context, right? What does it mean to move from the realm of Satan into the realm of God? From the realm of darkness to the realm of light. What does it mean? I'll tell you what it means. It's this simple. It's this simple. Because you can be religious, a devoted, well-intending religious person and still be in the clutches of Satan. This, it's this simple. When you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're in the clutches of yourself and Satan. But when you surrender to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and accept that everything that he has done is enough for you for time and eternity, you've moved yourself from the world of sin, death and Satan into the life of the Holy Spirit given through faith in Christ believing, faith in Christ is believing that everything he has done is enough that's what it is and that is the inheritance it even goes beyond that because the inheritance goes on into eternal life 
And it's faith in Christ. See where it says faith in me? That's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the inheritance among those that are sanctified by faith in... I'm surprised they haven't put Jesus. In fact, we're going to look at this. Hang on a sec. Um, where can we go? We've got to get away from the Jehovah Witness stuff. We're in Acts 26 verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18. This is Galatians. Can they get us to Acts this lot? Um, no. Hang on. Let's just go here. Acts 26 18. I bet you it says Jesus. No, nah, by faith in me. Um, let's try this. By faith in me. But it's referring to Christ, okay? So, okay, that's fair. Let's go. Therefore, King Agrippa, I did not become disobedient to the heavenly vision, but to those in Damascus first, and then to those in Jerusalem, and over all the country of Judea, and also to the nations. I was bringing the message that they should repent and turn to God by doing works that befit repentance. Now, this is critical. What are works that befit repentance? You've got to get this right. You've got to get this right. I'll tell you, please listen. Works that befit repentance are works of surrender. They're not works of commission. They're works of omission. It's believing that what Jesus has done is all sufficient for you for time and eternity. It's not what you do. It's what Jesus has done for you and everyone else. That's what works that befit repentance is. Because most religions will make you think, oh, you've got to do this and you've got to... It's not. It's this not. is why the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. However, because I have experienced the help that is from God, I continue to this day bearing witness to both small and great, saying nothing except what the prophets as well as Moses stated was going to take place. Now, what was that? That was the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, which were fulfilled in Christ. Prophecy, fulfillment, prophecy, fulfillment, prophecy, fulfillment. This is just 44 of them. Oh, I think there's way more than that. That's what they were talking about. That's what Paul was telling everyone. That Christ was to suffer and so that on. That the Christ was to suffer, and that is the first to be resurrected from the dead. He was going to proclaim light, both to this people and to the nations. And what was that light? It wasn't what you were going to do or not do. To make God happy or stop him from being sad, it was what Jesus did for you. Oh, gee, it's a simple message, but so hard to grasp. Now, as Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, You are going out of your mind, Paul. Great learning is driving you out of your mind. Now, that's what happens, right? And this is what's the first thing they said to Stuart, XJ Dub, is you've got a mental illness. No, no, no. No, no, no. People that aren't theologically trained cannot understand the warfare going on between the people that you that think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad and the people that have just accepted Christ and share his message, the good news of Christ. They'll say you're going mad because it seems like you're mad. There's nothing you need to do. I can just get out and live. I can just get out and live. All this God stuff that, oh, come on. They're running the Jehovah Witnesses off their feet. But Paul said, I am not going out of my mind, Your Excellency Festus, but I am speaking words of truth and of a sound mind. For a fact, the king to whom I am speaking so freely well knows about these things. I am convinced that not one of these things escapes his notice, for none of this has been done in a corner. Do you, King Agrippa, believe the prophets? I know that you believe. But Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, you would persuade me to become a Christian. At this, Paul said, I wish to God that whether in a short time or in a long time, 
not only you, but also all those who hear me today, would become men such as I am, with the exception of these prison bonds. Then the king rose, and so did the governor, and Bernice, and the men seated with them. But as they were leaving, they began saying to one another, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or prison bonds. Agrippa then said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. But in his desperateness, right, in his concern that they were going to kill him, he did appeal to Caesar. Now, it's 5.22 p.m. We've done two chapters. That's the end of chapter 26. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. It's been... Please listen. There's nothing you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. It's 5.22 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is Dr. J.W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.